Okay, welcome to a WordPress Photo Connected Learning uh, discussion. Today I have with me uh, Matt Ford from uh, Vignette uh, Interactive and also Dan Chung from Newshooter.com. And we're here to talk about the difference between a DSLR and a, a video camera. And, and for a multimedia journalist, which is the, the choice? Which is the one that you should be going for if you're just starting out in this field, if you're wanting to work on online video? I'm wondering if I could start with Dan, just to give us a quick introduction to um, where did the DSLR come into the field? When did it come in as a video camera? Obviously, previously it was just a stills camera. And what is its advantages over the um, the ENG, the, the professional TV camera gear that other people have been using, you know, for, for, for donkey's years? I mean, DSLR is basically Con, Nikon, and then Canon um, introduced uh, video capable DSLRs. Um, why was this revolutionary? Well, one was cost, because a lot of journalists were buying DSLRs anyway, so essentially you get the video function for free. Uh, two is size, uh, and then three, and probably most importantly, uh, was image. Um, and what it allowed you to do was capture an image that had the, the look and the feel of uh, cinema, or, or the still photo, depending on which way you look at it, but um, shallower depth of field, more control over depth of field, um, uh, and therefore uh, a more cinematographic, photographic look. Um, and that got people very excited. Um, and at the time when that happened, it was astronomically expensive to buy a video camera or a cinema camera that did the same thing. And even if you could, it was large and impractical to use in the field. So that's how it all got started. And, and, and what has happened since then? So this is something that happened, what, in 2008, around that time? Yes, 2008, 2009. Uh, the 5D Mark II basically came out in 2008, as of the Nikon V90. Um, and what's happened is that uh, we had a massive boom in the use of DSLRs. You had photographers shooting video clips and then whole video reports. You had TV cameramen and, and traditional video journalists um, ditching their big news cameras in favor of DSLRs, um, part mostly for the aesthetic, but also because it's in a risky situation, fast-moving situation, like something like Syria, um, it was easier to run around with DSLR. Uh, and then manufacturers got wise to this, realized that this is, this, this, is, this is what people were doing. Canon themselves have admitted it was kind of a happy accident that this became as big and popular as uh, it did. So they then responded by making uh, video cameras that were A, smaller, and B, gave the image that was much more like a DSLR. So, that, so these days you have a choice between the two. You have a, uh, an improved DSLR, which has got an improved, and they often have um, improved video function. And then you have dedicated video cameras, which will give you essentially the same look, but more of the form factor of a conventional video camera. Sure. And Matt, you um, have recently done a project for National Geographic Online um, down in the south of Egypt. Can you just talk through your kind of choices of what cameras you went with for that project and why? Well, most of the stuff that we do in Egypt, we shoot on the 5D Canon 5D Mark III, um, and and I also have a 60D that I use for some protest environment stuff because you know it's cheaper if I if it's broken or. Something happens to it. I'm less worried about it. Um, but basically, I can have a whole cinema kit um, in basically one bag, and that's the big advantage. Um, I mean, I'm a film school brat, so I, you know, went to film school, worked in Hollywood for three years, and then when I got into journalism, it was about the time, it was just before um, the DSLR movement started to come on. And and when it came, it was like, wow, I can replicate the stuff that we did out, you know, when I was working used to doing you know, non-sync audio and, and doing that separately. So for me, it was, it was old hat to, to get into, like, that kind of workflow. You can make it work um, in a wide variety of situations, but um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to compete with the kind of cinematic look that you can get with DSLRs in, in that small of a package. But can I ask you a question? If, if you were working, you're working for National Geographic online, but if you were working for National Geographic television, would you still be using the same cameras, or would you be, be using something different? Yeah. Uh, if I had a Canon C300, or if I had you know some other higher-end broadcast camera that I could use, and they had the budget for it uh, to rent, then sure, I might 
it might move up to that, but the DSLR gives two distinct advantages. A, it's a really small kit. Um, it's easy to move in and out of airports, especially in places like Egypt right now, where you know, lower profile is important in certain situations, and DSLRs can offer that. Um, but it does have its shortcomings that sometimes if you want to use a really big, uh, if you want to do a bigger shoot, sometimes you're going to want to go with bigger kit. Mm. And Dan, I mean, what's your opinion on this? You work both for online and also for a number of TV networks in your, in your work and for advertising and other things as well. So, you know, wh when do you make the choice to go with a DSLR as opposed to uh, taking a, 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 vi well, a dedicated I, I, video camera? I, I honestly think we're probably beyond DSLR now for most just because if you're going for, you know, if you've got a, a well-paying TV job, you will obviously be looking to use a camera that's dedicated to that. Uh, but actually, on, on, the, on the sort of um, compact system cameras, which aren't technically DSLRs, which I would also argue are a better tool, um, cheaper, smaller, lighter, more likely to have the right video function than a DSLR does. Um, now, I, I don't quite know why we're as attached to DSLRs as a whole in the journalism industry as we as we seem to have become. I think it's partly familiarity with, uh, with photographers. You know, they're, they're used to a system like Canon or Nikon. They don't want to move to a Sony or a Panasonic or something else like that. You know, and, and, but uh, you know, if you're starting out from scratch uh, and if you want the best all-round combination of, of a discrete image, you know, you have cameras like the GH, Panasonic GH4, which was launched today, uh, compact system camera, not a DSLR, hasn't got a traditional prism, um, smaller, lighter, faster, shoots 4K, costs probably less than $2,000, um, has an excellent HD mode, and takes pretty good stills to boot. So, you know, why you would opt for a DSLR over that, I'm not really have. So, exactly, yeah. If I'm, if, I, if I'm going out on a shoot, you know, I've already got a lot of lens, like a lot of glass that I'm taking with me, and I've got bodies that we're using for still photography. So if my primary camera goes down, I got a lot of backups, you know, and working. Yeah, but then, I mean, also don't forget a lot of these lenses are compatible with, you know, with. Um, um, yeah, you know, the lens adapters. But I mean, having having an actual backup camera. Um, I mean, I think you're right. If you're starting from scratch, I think we're now at a point where there's a, a, a large amount of options. As if, for instance, you know, I would say something like this. I don't even see that, but the little um, GM1, the Panasonic mate, you know. Costs five hundred dollars, maybe six hundred dollars. Um, okay, it has a lot of the limitations of DSLR, but the form factor is frankly vastly superior, um, and the image quality I think is practically as good as a five D Mark II. So why would you not use that versus a DSLR? And you know what? It also takes pictures in a much more discreet way. You know, probably more akin to the way you might work with an iPhone than you would work with a conventional DSLR. But I would argue that for a lot of journalism, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, mm. you know, um, absolute technical quality for a piece of kit like this in stills versus the 5D Mark III, of course, the new, new world order video is probably the priority. Stills is the sort of, you know, um, the second most important thing. They're both quite important, but I, I think you know, I, I have a hard time recommending a 5D Mark III over a camera like this, which is, you know, you can buy four of these for a 5D Mark III body, probably five of them, you know, have as many spares as you wanted and have superior image quality. It's a hard thing to argue against, I think. Mm -hmm. So we're really dividing into sort of three different types of cameras now. So we're talking about DSLRs, i.e. the 5D, um, and Nikon equivalents, etc. We're also talking about these smaller format uh, um, form uh, of cameras that, that you're showing us here, Dan, that... that uh, uh, mirrorless cameras that are able to give us you know, really nice quality um, at a much smaller form factor. And then thirdly, we're talking about dedicated video cameras yeah. Yeah. Um, that have the same qualities of the, of the DSLR or same size uh, sensors, um, but are, are set up better for the professional to use. So can you talk a little bit about the kind of advantages of those video cameras as opposed to the other two types of, uh, um, of Well, I'm not sure. Okay, for journalism, I'm not sure that they have as big an advantage. They have an advantage if you're in a, uh, a set sort of production um, cycle, you know, and you're working for a broadcaster or, 
somebody who, who wants their, their file a certain way, needs the audio a certain way, needs to hand, needs to, expects to see a certain kind of file delivered to them. Um, and also, if you're going to spend hours and hours with a camera on your shoulder, trying to get stable shots, then obviously something that's designed to sit on your shoulder and bounce properly is, is much better than, than you know, a small little camera like this, uh, in terms of being able to get stable shots for half of the day. That's the reason why news cameras look, look the way they are. I and mean, people, I think a lot of people, there's a misconception about why the news camera is the way it is. You know, it's not big and heavy just because, for the sake of being big and heavy, it's, it's big and heavy because it adds usability to the, the fun, you know, the, the form of it is designed to be usable and get steady shots for a long period of time, be able to stand outside court, be able to run around and do various things. Um, so that's, that's probably why uh, a professional video camera optimized for video um, has advantages. Uh, then you've got cameras like the C300, which are actually slightly different um, concept-wise. They don't really go on the shoulder. They're more designed to be used in the hand, um, but still have fantastic image quality. Uh, what they all have in common is really good audio. Um, they have neutral density filters. They're quick to use. They provide better images. As simple as that. Um, but I think there's a whole other argument you know, in favor of like cameras like this, we've got another one here, this is Sony A7R, um, which is, uh, I think, far more used um, as a video camera, and actually probably the stills camera in a lot of instances, to uh, something like a 5D Mark III. You know, I mean, it's it's tiny, you know, in this case, Sorry. I've got like the lenses on it, um, but it has a microphone jack, a headphone jack, audio level meters, peaking, magnification of the image while shooting, full manual control. Um, okay, the absolute image is not as good in this as a 5D Mark III, but for most online publication, you'll never notice the difference. So, you know, it's a photographer's yeah. tool, actually. Yeah. I mean, for me, the biggest the biggest difference is something from photography is, is really the ergonomics. Um, I mean, my shooting style for video is I tend to I tend to keep it about center chest, uh, my camera most of the time. Little amount of time on shoulder, not a lot of shots at eye level, but I like to get high shots and I like to get low shots. And most DSLR rigs just are not as conducive to, to moving around to getting those kind of variety of height angles because you're kind of stuck to looking at the monitor. You need an external monitor on board. You need to put stabilizing stuff on it to make it work. Um, for your kind of ergonomic approach um, if you're used to shooting video. So most video cameras are kind of built, you know, for that kind of shooting style straight out of the box and have all the audio equipment and you don't need to add ND filters. Um, so it's, it's if, if you're strictly doing video, some of them are just, you know, at the base level more geared towards that. Um, but there is, there is something to be said for just, I mean, I think... I think the 5D Mark III and the cameras like that are probably the worst ergonomically, but actually that, as a video tool, is surprisingly ergonomic. You know, you can actually just hold this. Um, you know, it's got an EVF that's higher quality than the EVF in the C300. You know, you have a flip-out screen. If you want to go high, you can flip it up and down. You know, you can, you can look any which way at it. You can hold it at chest height, and you've still got audio level meters. You've got autofocus that functions if you have the right lens. Um, Honestly, I think this is where it's going. And by the time you've got five-axis stabilization, which for those of you who don't follow this stuff basically means that the sensor will move to combat shake. Um, you know, for journalism, I think it's either this or it's something big, and I think it leaves the sort of DSLR for dust, to be honest. Okay, great. So just to conclude... So we're looking really, we've divided the, the, the camera market into three different types of cameras. Um, and we've said that the, the video, camera, uh, the video uh, camera that's dedicated as video has got um, some, some great sort of advantages in terms of the way that you hold it. It has ND filters built in, which means that you can get those wide apertures in bright light uh, without having to, to screw something to the front of the lens. Um, knowing that with video as opposed to stills, uh, that you're dealing with much uh, slower shutter speeds than you would be able to do mm. um, with a, a stills camera. Um, there's also fantastic audio quality, the audio functionality. You don't have to pin uh, other things to your camera uh, and, and add monitors and other things as well. So um, overall, the video camera um, will give you a, a big advantage just for video, but on 
on the on the downside, you don't get still pictures out of it, which you may do, particularly if you're doing an online piece, and you know you need to have stills as well as video. And uh, as Dan was saying, that the smaller form factor and some of the amazing things that the functionality that's coming into these new cameras, that um, with these new cameras as a journalist, this gives you all sorts of other advantages of keeping a low profile, being able to get into places, work quickly, um, not have to carry so much gear, etc. Uh, as you're working, and still get amazing quality. So just, just a final question to both of you. If you were going to be recommending to somebody on our Connected Learning course, somebody who's just starting out uh, for the first time <laughs> is considering being a multimedia journalist working both with stills and with video, um, and they're about to buy equipment, in terms of the camera, um, would you have one choice or one place where you would go right now? Let's start with Matt. Um, I don't have like one product that I could recommend because honestly I think it's really different for everyone in their shooting style. I mean, get the best image quality you can and get to a big store like B&H or some other place where you can get your hands on a lot of different stuff and, and try and figure out what's going to you know, fit you the most. Um, Dan probably has more experience working with a lot of different cameras and stuff and might be able to recommend something. Uh, but I haven't reviewed like the latest line of stuff in the past six months for you. I mean, I think entirely, like actually Matt says, entirely depends on, depends on your budget and who you're working for and where you see yourself going. If you're studying and you're purely intending to study, you know, not you're not trying to make your living for the next 12 months or so, um, I think I would push towards a compact system camera, um, mainly because they're not that expensive. Um, I would argue that if you had a significant pool of money for your studies, um, that it would be best spent um, on probably as little kit as possible and as much uh, traveling, um, shooting, um, and project work as you can ma actually do because that's where you're going to really learn you know, your trade and, and the gadgets will have changed by the time that you get around to actually graduating and doing something um, with that equipment. So um, I, I think it's a common mistake that a lot of people go on, on, on multimedia courses actually make and it's to spend a hell of a lot of money on equipment to start off with, get probably the best that they can get and then have no money to actually go and shoot anything. Uh, and I, I, I would totally recommend they, that they, you, you, you shop economically get something that's good but not maybe the best um, and, and take another view in 12 months when you're actually not, you know, you're actually out there doing it for a living and hope that you might actually have got a job with somebody who's actually going to provide it for you anyway so you're not having to provide it yourself. When, I mean, when I was in film school, like, we had to buy film stock. We had to spend tons of money on film stock and we had to rent very expensive equipment. Um, we couldn't even dream of owning any of this stuff. Like, I wish that these tools were around, you know, when I was, when I was studying or first breaking in. It's absolutely right. We're at this really fortunate time where you know people are doing really amazing work on their iPhones. So you know, focus on telling stories, focus on doing that really well, and like invest in getting the good audio with those cameras, and invest in the projects. Because as you make more money, as you get more projects, you can invest in in getting yourself out more and more and, and build off of it. I mean, a lot of what is it inspired my kids? It's just the stuff I keep building out over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just you try to feed one story for you and that influences the, the kit that you eventually build out. Okay, thank you very much. There's lots of reviews on all of these products, I think, on newshooter.com, uh, which is the site that Dan runs. I'd recommend you go over that to there if you're looking for uh, uh, <clears throat> getting uh, some sort of idea from the experts on, on what they think of these new products, particularly the ones that have just come out, because it's changing all the time and it's a great news site. Um, thank you also, uh, <clears throat> Matt, for uh, joining us. Matt is one of the tutors on uh, the Connected Learning, the World Press Photo Connected Learning, um, and uh, will be uh, coming back and forth uh, throughout, uh, as I'm sure Dan will come in uh, once or twice as well before we get to the end. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.